Welcome to the Debit This, Credit That podcast with Wheeler Accountants located in San Jose, California. In this podcast, we discuss how to solve accounting challenges in both your personal life and your business. We take an energetic, tech-savvy approach to solving accounting challenges that steal your focus and your time. Now, on to the show with your tech-savvy accounting experts, Matt Wheeler and Michael Bryant. Welcome to episode 27 of the Debit This, Credit That podcast by Wheeler Accountants with your hosts, Matt Wheeler and Michael Bryant. Today, we have another guest on the podcast today, an experienced podcaster. How many do you have now, Scott? 20, I think. 22, 20. 23. So you, you guys have passed me up. So right? we're on 27, so yeah. we have more than you, but <laughs> you're still quite experienced. Not that we're keeping score. Uh, Scott is a registered investment advisor and CFP. He is uh, part of Better Wealth, which is an investment advisory firm upstairs from our uh, our office here at 1475 Saratoga Avenue in San Jose. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, Scott's industry a little bit, you know, get some answers from him that I think will be useful for individual clients on, you know, what they should be thinking about in terms of investment planning and financial planning, planning for retirement, kind of the fees that you end up paying inside of your investment accounts when you're working with someone like Scott and uh, how his industry works in that respect. And there's a lot of a lot of fine print, I guess you could say, and, and yeah. fees can sometimes be hidden and that kind of stuff. And so it's useful for people to know because I think a lot of times, you know, they're not really seeing how much they're actually paying. And Scott's a big guy, not on performance, but about, you know, planning for the future, making sure your spending is in control and then really monitoring the expenses on your investments as well, because that eats into the return, especially in the kind of low return environment, the new normal that we're in since the big crash. So welcome, Scott. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, great to have you, Scott. Um, why don't we uh, start, I guess, there's a, there's a lot going on in your industry, and you talk about it fairly often with us, but I think it'd be useful for our clients to hear about the whole regulations that, I guess, were going to go into place and then ended up getting repealed with the stroke of a pen or something, is, is what I understand. But give us a little background, I guess, on what's going on in your industry. Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a good, uh, good question and a good topic. Essentially, we're talking about the fiduciary standard, and there's lots of details and laws and regulations about it, but essentially, the easiest way I like to think about it is, is that the fiduciary standard that is your financial advisor, is he, is he required or is she required to put your financial interests first ahead of their own? And although there are lots of good people in the industry, there are, there are some not so good people, just like there are in every industry. And the fiduciary standard, I think, is is what we're talking about. And, and you want to work with people who have that, that role, that official role. In fact, I just went back and got another accreditation. I went and got my AIF, so I'm now an accredited investment fiduciary for clients. And you're going to see that accreditation, just like you see the CFP, I think, more and more and more as time goes by. Is that a new accreditation? No, it's, it's a good question. It's been around for about 30 years, actually. Oh, okay. But I think as this fiduciary issue becomes much more prominent and much more uh, available for retail investors to look at and understand, you're going to see a lot more people with the AIF cert uh, certificate, at least. So we throw around the term fiduciary quite a bit. What, what exactly does being a fiduciary for your clients mean? Yeah, so, you know, there's there's actually a specific legal code of what it has to be. And, and without getting into that, you know, legal gobbledygook, as I call it, you know, essentially it means that I have to always in every interaction put my put the client's financial interests ahead of my financial interests. And, and that's they, essentially and they, what it means. And they put that kind of stuff in place because if we go way back to kind of like the old days or like, a, you know, you watch like the boiler room type movies where guys made money on commissions and trying to sell you stuff or, or make trades. That, that was their interest kind of being ahead of the client, obviously. It, it was. And, and it really comes back to another way to think about this is structure versus function. Right. And I have a belief sort of from an engineering perspective that our structure is actually what dictate, dictates the function that we're going to be able to implement. And so the structure of the industry is really built upon something that said, here are products that we have to sell, and we might have disclosures for these individual products that we have, but all we have to do was to make sure that the product was suitable for the client. We didn't have to make sure that it was in their best financial interest. And suitability is some sort of lower legal standard than the fiduciary standard. It is. That's what this is all about. Broker-dealer world still has that structure. And that structure dictates their function, 
And that means that they have to make sure that what they recommend to clients are suitable for them, not necessarily uh, in their best financial interest. So interesting. So, so, I mean, give us some examples. If a client is basically working with someone that's at one of the larger brokerages then, and they have their own, you know, brokerage XYZ, you know, mutual fund, you know, targeted mutual small cap fund or whatever, it's their, com- it's their brokerage's fund and they may have all these fees and stuff built into that and they're, they're pushing that and all they really need to meet is some sort of suitable suitability standard. Correct. Even though it may not be the best fund for the client. Right. And so in other words, if you had, if you had two different you know, small cap mutual funds, if you were looking at that, and if you're selling it from a, a broker dealer world, right, where you live in this suitability environment, you might say, well, this is a really good performing you know, investment, and I might believe that that's what's best. Well, maybe you've disclosed that your firm is getting paid revenue sharing you know, by that mutual fund industry, but nobody discloses that. You know, here's all the disclosures. Here's a 30-page thing when you open up your document. Here's the annual disclosure agreement you get from the brokerage firm. People don't read those things. Yeah, no, we don't read those. No, <laughs> so, so you've got all that information there, but, but now, it, well, what if there's a different small cap mutual fund that doesn't have that revenue sharing agreement that maybe is doesn't have a selling agreement with that brokerage firm. Well, what if that one has just as good as performance, but it's less expensive, right? Well, now I would have to use that fund because it's actually going to be better for the client in the long run than one that maybe is a preferred mutual fund from some fund family for my brokerage firm or something like that. It just gets very it gets clouded, right? And it gets so complicated for the individual investor to figure out what's in their best interest. So you want a professional who is obligated to do something in your best interest for you. Why is it so hard for the individual investor to figure out how much they're paying in fees? Yeah, it's just, um, you know, when I was um, when I was at a brokerage firm, when I started, I think the disclosure was like 40 pages long. I think there was like eight to nine to 10 different ways that I got paid. It was hard for me to even keep track of it, and I was a professional in the industry. And so I think there's been a movement afoot, you know, within the last 20 years, and we're seeing more and more of it, to try to break out all those different conflicts of interest and try to have it be much more simple in terms of the approach that you have. So what I find today is that people who are still working in that broker-dealer environment, you know, they're good people, but they're, they're and you can, the way the, the rules are set up, and this is where it gets more clouded, is it? As an advisor in a, in a broker dealer world, you can have one, you can have that fiduciary relationship where you got one foot there, and then you're, you cross the line and you can have it where you're doing commissions too, and then you're going to try to trade information back and forth with the client to tell, well, this time I'm acting like a fiduciary, well, this time I'm acting in a suitability standard. It gets really confusing, and we had the Department of Labor trying to make some of those changes, and then with the administration change, we decided to you know, put everything on hold for a little bit. And I think what will come out of it is, one standard that, that goes across the industry, but they're not there yet in terms of that. So in the meantime, I think understanding what a fiduciary is and how all these different products work and understanding how the firm is set up, it doesn't mean that you're getting taken advantage of for sure. It just means that it's a little harder, I think, for somebody to always have your best interest at heart when their structure is set up such that they can get paid by commission, such that they can get paid by revenue sharing from mutual fund companies, such that they can get paid you know, for uh, sales incentives, you know, other things like that. Whereas it might be easier and better just to get all those things out of the equation and not have that structure there, to have a function that really dictates what people do in terms of the fiduciary standard. But if you're, if you're a client and you're just looking at your investment account, you know, quarterly, there's a fee coming out for the fee they're paying, and they're thinking, okay, this is how much I'm paying for my investment advisor, but that's not the whole story. It's where you're, you're No, saying. you know, you've got to look into, you know, you've got to go look and see, well, what are, the, what are the actual investment costs? What are the costs of those mutual funds that you own, ETFs that you may own? You have to add that cost up, and that gets added to the fee that you're paying an advisor, uh, possibly. You also have to go look at what the filings are, and are there any incentives that that company has to promote one mutual fund company over another mutual fund company? It just, you know, it gets super hard to look at that stuff and to figure it out as an investor. And a lot of that stuff gets basically hidden in the return. Right? It's funny, right? The, the law says that there's only certain fees that have to be disclosed and other fees that don't have to be disclosed by mutual fund companies, by advisors. And so what's disclosed to the client is what the advisor charges, not necessarily you know, the, the mutual fund expense ratios are disclosed through prospectuses. Again, Michael, 
Do you read your mutual fund perspective? No, I do not. Have you ever run a mutual fund perspective? Uh, no, they're really long, Scott. <laughs> and boring. <laughs> oh, so you've got to look at those kind of stuff. I think that's why a lot of people, a lot of firms like us, you know, we'll do a complimentary second opinion where we meet with clients all the time, prospective clients, or just you know somebody who comes in and wants some help. You know, we don't mind paying it forward. So we'll sit down, we'll explain to them a little bit about what are the fees in their accounts that they have now, and just maybe educate them about what other alternatives are out there uh, for them if they want to make those changes. So, so Scott, how does Better Wealth, your firm, charge fees? Yeah, that's a good question. So we are what's considered a fee-only firm. So we only charge a fee to manage assets and to provide financial planning for clients. Uh, we don't accept any revenue sharing. We don't charge any commission products. We don't um, sell any products that provide us a separate payment outside of the fee that we charge a client. Like an annuity or life insurance. That's right. So we will recommend clients, you know, go get life insurance, and we'll help them make that decision. They can go to a life insurance agent that they may work with. They can, you know, go to somebody that we refer them to. It really doesn't matter to us. Our job is to make sure that they have the appropriate amount of life insurance and that they have the right insurance product that best meets their goals, not something that best meets the sales goals of a life insurance firm or a brokerage firm, or not something that meets the sales contest quota for somebody to qualify for something else, or something where they get paid more on to do something else. So we're agnostic in terms of products. What we're really trying to do is to figure out what are the client's goals and how can we help them get to those goals. So That's the benefit of being independent and not being with a major... Yeah, and being a fiduciary, being a registered investment advisor, absolutely. And so, you know, our fees, you know, 100% of our clients play 1% or less. Most, I think the average across our entire firm is like 0.75 or 0.85. So it really does depend. But if anybody has an account that's 2 million or under, it's 1%. Above 2 million, it's 0.85%. 3 million, 0.75%. It just goes down from there. So that's in terms of the fees, how it works for us. And how does that compare to the, the industry as a whole? Well, I, you know, I think the, the industry average is about 1.25 to 1.5. And then, that, again, that doesn't include the investment expenses, right. right, to particular investments. So you're still seeing accounts around 2% all in, as we say, whereas, you know, most of our accounts are somewhere around 1% or 1.1 when you go all in, when you count on the mutual funds, uh, ETFs. So we hear a lot about the, the robo-advisors lately, you know, and these basically you know, the computer doing your asset allocation stuff for you and, and buying and, and selling and that kind of stuff. What kind of fees are associated with those services and what are the pros and cons of that versus working with yourself? Yeah, good question. So, you know, if you feel comfortable doing things on your own, that might be a good solution for you. You know, for years, people have worked with Vanguard, right? Uh, T. Rowe Price or other kinds of, you know, do it yourself. Uh, maybe BlackRock ETFs or something like that, where you feel you can set up your own investment strategy. What I think the robos do is they make it a little easier for you to do it online. You know, some of their costs are, I think some of them are 0.5%, some of them are 0.25. I've seen some around 0.15. That's the cost for them to do all the account opening, to do all the rebalancing, to do all of that. That's fine, but that's still not, as what I say, that can be a good good resource for somebody who wants to to do it yourself or but that is still not going to help you figure out what's your goal, what's your retirement plan, how much life insurance do you need, you know, sh- how often should I rebalance, oh, I need to make some withdrawals coming up, or I've got some extra goals that I want to do, how do I fund those? There's still no trusted advisor. And there are people who need that, and so that's where we come in. We don't have to be right for everybody. And just like there are some people who can do their taxes on their own, right? But that's okay. You know? right. You're here for the folks who want that professional advice, want that coach. And how often do you meet with your clients normally? Yeah, good question. So, you know, normally when we first get started, it's probably six, seven, eight times, maybe over a whole year when we're getting started. Once things are set up, you know, we're, we like to do semi-annual reviews with clients. A lot of our clients are local, and even then we're still doing more and more reviews on the phone or through video conferencing, just with some of the Bay Area traffic and other things like that. But essentially, we, you know, we'll touch in people either on the phone or in, in person at least two to four to five times a year. So and I think that you know that comes back, that earlier conversation we were talking about, you know, why why use a financial advisor or what's the robo world about or other things. You know, there's so many other situations in my life where I have a, a coach and that coach helps me reach my goals quicker or reach my goals with more confidence that I'm gonna get there, whether that's a fitness coach, whether that's a nutrition coach, you know, whether that's a business coach, you know, all those different things. 
help us. And so that's really, and likewise, when, when you get somebody tax return done, you know, they're helping, you're helping them with tax planning. You're helping them with confidence, knowing what they have to do and what they don't have to do around their business, their personal finances. It's the same thing with us around financial planning. What people really want to know is, am I on track to meet my goals? And, it, and it's funny, when I interact and, and have worked with people now for 18 years on this, when people do not reach their financial goals, it's seldom, if ever, because of bad investment performance. When people don't reach their goals, it's fundamentally because they didn't identify what the goal was. They didn't have a plan for that goal. They either then, A, didn't save enough for that goal, or they spent too much money. And so we try to focus on those areas that we can control with clients. Do they have a goal? Is it written down? Are they on track to meet that goal? What are the things they need to do to, to have retirement eligible for them? We're trying to work on all of those things. Control the things you can control and not worry about the things you can't control. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned coaching and, you know, one of the primary functions of coaching is provide feedback, right? Provide feedback often to help someone reach their goals. And you're not getting feedback when you're using an automated service, you know, for your taxes or for your asset allocation, that kind of stuff. You're not getting that constant feedback you need to make sure you are on track because it's all these little things that you do built up over time that really get you to where you want to be. It's not like some magic thing or, you know, I mean, some people, yeah, they get lucky and make the jackpot on something or whatever, you right. know, and don't need to worry about it. And then it's about just not losing the money. That's a whole different set of problems, you know? Yeah. It's, another example I always use is, um, you know, once in a while, I like to go out to a nice dinner with my wife. And when we do that, we generally don't go to McDonald's. Right? And when I'm at McDonald's, I'm not looking for somebody to help me with selections of the menu. It's self-service. I can look up there and I can see what I want. I actually don't eat at McDonald's, but you know, <laughs> I can look at the menu and I can figure it out. But when I go to a nice restaurant and I'm celebrating my anniversary or a birthday or something like that with my wife, you know, I look at the menu, but I'm going to ask the, the waiter or the waitress, hey, wh what do you really like? Or this is, what do you think of this dish or that dish? And I'm going to be looking for some consulting back and forth, right? They're going to, they're going to earn, you know, my trust and my order throughout that menu. And so that's what I'm looking for. And it's just a, another example of, you know, I'm not going to just retire. I'm not going to have an anniversary every year. Like I'm not going to have retirement every year. You know, I can't screw this up. So having somebody who's a professional coach who can provide me a second opinion, you know, who can really be somebody who thinks differently about things than I do, who does it every day. It's like that great book. I think it was written about Abraham Lincoln, and it was called Team of Rivals. You know, when he assembled his cabinet, he didn't want people who thought just like him all around the table. He wanted people who thought different than him. And likewise, when somebody hires a tax professional, when they hire an investment professional, a legal professional, we're, we're hiring somebody to think different than how we think, who's an expert in the industry, to help us reach our goals quicker and to help, help us reach our goals with more confidence. Sounding board. Yeah. Right? yeah. We, we try and act like that for our clients. Yeah. So if you look back on your career, you know, now, what are what are some of the key things you've seen people do over the years to where they end up being successful in the end in terms of, you know, financially secure for their retirement and everything? Like, is there any common themes or traits that you've noticed that have, that have yeah. led to that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, some of them are pretty straightforward. You have a, a retirement plan at work. If you have a 401k plan or something like that, you participate in the plan and you learn to live your life in such a way that you can max out your 401k contribution. That way, you're, you know, if your company has a match with that contribution, you're getting the full match. So you know, I always tell people, you know, taking advantage of every pre-tax contribution opportunity you have. It's never going to be enough, but it's, it's something that you got to do. Another thing is taking advantage of the, the Roth IRA, if, if you're eligible for that. There's other ways to do it, even if you're not eligible, you know, still contributing to a traditional IRA. There are some things the government gives us. They're sort of like, you know, when you're taking exams in, in school and it's like the easy one that everybody's going to get the answer right. You know, participating in the retirement plan at work, you know, contributing to a Roth IRA. Those are the ones you want to check right away to make sure you're doing. The other thing that's, that's really, really important, and, I, and I, I see this as key, key from people, is that they identified that they had a plan you know, in the long term that they were going to get to someplace. And they wrote that plan down and they had established goals along the way. They also had somebody who was going to help them. They had a coach, right? You know, if we're trying to get in shape, if we're trying to reach a particular goal, uh, whatever it is, you know, identifying what that goal is. You know, I identify goals 
on a, on a daily and a weekly and a monthly and a quarterly basis and an annual basis with, you know, personally for me. So we try to have clients do that. So again, it's, it's taking advantage of all those pre-tax opportunities you have, taking advantage of the Roth IRA, having a plan, you know, getting a coach. Um, and then the other thing, you know, lots of times we'll talk about is just um, trying to look at situations and understand what you can control and what you can't control, especially with the financial media and what happens in the markets and everything. There's so many things we can't control, but there are some things we can control. So we always try to get people to focus on what are the things you can control. You can control, is, is your plan written down? Are you contributing to your plan every year? Are you contributing enough? You know, are you properly, you know, have the proper asset allocation for what your time horizon is? You know, that's a really big one. Are you rebalancing your portfolio on an annual or semi-annual basis? Those are the kinds of things that, that what we've seen when people who, who reach those successful goals or reach that, that end prize of being retired really have done well. And then the last one is just sort of, you know, everybody has their own relationship with money, but I think fundamentally understanding that uh, you 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 can't outspend what you, you know, you just can't outspend. So understanding what a budget is and then being able to live within that budget. So that's that's huge. Yeah, I mean, such, it seems like such a basic concept, yet so few people, I think, adhere to it. And, you know, I, I wish there was a little more financial literacy in the world, you know, and, and it was more focused on in school, you know, at all levels, starting from being a kid all the way up until you get through college. And really, you know, you can, a lot of people get through school and never take any classes really on yeah. like financial basics or accounting or just like balancing your own freaking checkbook and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know? Why are we not teaching that in high school? Yeah. It's amazing. And, and technology, in some ways, technology has not been, uh, has helped us in this, in this area specifically. Like I remember when I got my first job and, you know, sort of later in high school and back then, right, you didn't have debit cards. So you got your paycheck and you took your paycheck to the bank and you cash your paycheck and you got cash and you put your cash in your wallet, right? And so I was doing that. And then as I was, you know, graduating and getting out of college, my dad sat me down one time and said, okay, here's, this is how it's going to work. You get your paycheck and you cash it. And I've got all these envelopes that he, he wrote out for me. And in one of the envelopes, he wrote rent, you know, and he said, now how much do you need? You know, how many times you get paid this month? And we took the amount of cash that I needed from like one paycheck or two paychecks and we put it in and I needed, you know, I don't know, $200 for rent. So we put $200 on an envelope and we put 200 bucks in there. And we did the same thing for gas, same thing for utilities. You know, we didn't have cell phones. Same thing for, you know, food, same thing for going to movies. And we had these different envelopes, right? And then as the month went on, if I ran out of money in my entertainment envelope, I didn't have any more money in my gas envelope. You know, my utilities were already paid. So I was going to have to go take money from my rent envelope, you know, to, to, to go have some fun. It made me stop and think. Whoa, do I want to take money from rent to go to a movie tonight? You know, how am I going to pay that rent next month? And so it, it was a little easier sometimes when we had cash because we learned those tricks, right? right. And uh, I still remember that lesson from my dad teaching me about having a budget. And my wife and I, you know, we don't do things by cash anymore, but we still have a budget and we still know what that is every month. And we look at it and we sort of say, were well, we in budget or over budget in this month? Yeah, so, Mint really helps track that. Now I get those emails halfway through the month. Uh, your entertainment is nearing the budget. And so then we have to scale back on entertainment. Yeah, there's actually a, uh, one called Envelopes. Oh, okay. It, so it, going it, with your cash it envelopes. Is, yeah. And, and we did a little blog about one of the different ways, what are, the, what are the technology tools that you can use to help you, like mint.com, yodely.com. There's lots of other ones out there. But fundamentally, learning to live on less than you make, right, after you do all your saving and everything else is one of the key things to, to having a successful retirement. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I wanted to touch on a couple of things that I've heard you talk about in the past, and I, I you had made some references to thoughts on like financial media and what we hear in the news and how should that affect our investing. Yeah, and, and what I always try to say is, you know, you can read the read the financial news for entertainment, not for investment strategy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So you really want to ignore the financial media because the financial media is much more about it's a business for them and their business is all about getting people to listen. And so they're going to you know, be as sensational as they can be to get you to buy the magazine, read the article, click on the link, whatever it may be. And that's not necessarily in your best, in your best interests. 
And so that financial media is not there just to disseminate information or what's happening with the market. It's there to really sell advertising so that they can have a profitable business. And so just, you know, always take it with a grain of salt. And remember that you know, what you want to, what you really want to do is you want to have a plan, right? You want to have a plan. You want to have a coach, right? You want to be able to know what your goals are. You want to be able to live within your budget. And you just want to be on track, knowing that you're on track for those things. And the financial media is not always going to help you do that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. How about um, like timing of the market? Should I be saving a bunch of money and then wait for like a big dip in, in the stock market before I invest? Yeah, that's a good question. So time in the market is academically been proven, right, and researched to not be – your odds of success are very, very low. So I think the best strategy, and they've looked at this, right? Because when you get, when you try to time the market, you know, because most people, what you said, Michael, was, is there a good time to invest? Well, yes, there's always a good time to invest. But the bigger thing about timing the market is people want to get out when it's a bad time, <laughs> right. right? More so what, what you end up having people do. And it doesn't work. You know, they've done studies after studies after studies around this, and it, it's been clearly proven that the ability to be able to time it right on the exit and then time it get it right the second time on the entrance when you go back in, it just doesn't work. So I think you're better off, you know, really having what a set plan is, contributing regularly to like your 401k, contributing regularly to an IRA, contributing regularly to an investment account. That doesn't mean you invest all your money every month. You know, I save up money, right, over time. And then when I do see a market correction, I figure everything's on sale. That's a good time to invest some of my money, mm -hmm. not necessarily all of my money, right? So you can definitely take advantage of that. And sometimes we would used to say, whenever you see the market drop 10%, that's a good time to add money to your portfolio. Not all of your money, but some of your money. Well, if you're financially disciplined, which is like some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, and you're always ma making sure you are building up and having a healthy surplus of savings and cash, you know, dry powder, basically, and that kind of stuff, then you can take advantage of those opportunities when they do come along. Right when there is a 2008, 2009, or something, if you're able to have some extra to put in as a tank, and I mean, look how well people have made out yeah. by doing that. And it's, you don't know when the bottom is going to be. You can't, you know, catch the falling knife, you know, quote unquote. But if you if you have that liquidity available and you're being financially disciplined the whole time, then you are going to be able to take advantage of some of the things as they pop up. Or, you know, one of your friends or someone comes to you with an investment opportunity that actually pencils out to be really good after you're doing your due diligence and everything, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're like, oh, I can't right now. I don't have the cash, you know, but if you, if you did and you can invest in it, I mean, you're going to hopefully do well if it's a good investment, right? You are. And there's a great quote from uh, Warren Buffett. When people are fearful, I'm greedy. And when people are greedy, I'm fearful. Right. And so the idea is don't follow the crowd. Right? Right. Step back. There was another one when I first started in my career, I got a brick. Uh, the company gave me a brick and on the brick, it had the uh, numbers one and four. So one and four. And I had it on my desk and they said, whenever you know, a client came in, they're going to ask you, what's that brick for? And it says, why does it say one and four? And the idea is, is well, when you invest with me, you can expect your account value to be down one in four years. And when it does, you're going to feel like throwing a brick through my window. So just remember, when you throw that brick through the window, wrap a check around it because that's the time to invest, right? So when you look at your statement and you're like, oh, it went down, <laughs> maybe that's a good time to invest, you know, kind of the idea behind that. We've also talked in the past about risk tolerance and, and what the correct risk tolerance is. Can, can you speak to, to risk tolerance for your individual clients? Yeah, risk tolerance, you know, getting back in that robo topic, right? If you're just online filling out a questionnaire, and that's traditionally what people think when they think about a risk tolerance questionnaire, you know, and they fill this out. Well, risk tolerance is not just a questionnaire. It's much more than a questionnaire. A questionnaire can be one tool part of it, but really it's, it's sitting down and understanding, well, first, what's the time horizon? That's the number one thing you want to look at. Second is what's your own experience? What's your gut check? How have you, you know, operated with your investments in the past when things have been good, when things have been bad? You know, it's, it's like going to, uh, going on a cruise or going to a buffet where you can eat all you want. Right. Everything's right there. Does that mean you eat everything? No, you still want to you know, have have some sort of resistance to understand what's good for you and what's not good for you. And so what we try to do is really sit down with each client and figure out what their risk tolerance should be for each goal. You're going to have a risk tolerance that we're going to set up for your retirement, one for maybe college savings, 
one for maybe a vacation home purchase, one for maybe something else. You know, that's what we call goals-based financial planning. And I think that's something that's really been in the, you know, in, in academic research, we're seeing more of it about the last five, maybe 10 years. And I think you're going to see more and more of it in the future. We really have a goals-based approach to all the financial planning so that every goal has its own portfolio. And every goal, you know, is tracking to that time horizon, to that risk tolerance that you have. So understanding your risk tolerance is absolutely critical to achieving your goals. It's just not something that one questionnaire can answer for you. It's sitting down and having a conversation and really working through many different variables to say, okay. And then it's talking about, well, here's what some expected returns might be like, positive and negative. What can you deal with? How have you dealt with that in the past? And then figuring out what's what's palatable for you in terms of being able to reach your goal, but also make sure that you're going to stay on track, that you're not going to bail out halfway through the journey because there's too much volatility in the portfolio. Sure. I mean, shouldn't the allocation really be more about how close you are to that goal and shifting more towards less volatility and that kind of stuff as you so you get closer so the portfolio is swinging you know, upwards and, you know, downwards and upwards less? Right, so it's a little more smooth near the end, not so much based on what you personally, emotionally feel. Because what you should really be doing is maintaining that financial discipline, just keeping your head down and not listening to the financial media, not looking at your account statement all the time, except you know at the updates you're doing with your coach to kind of check in, make sure you're on track, and just kind of stay the course. You know, that's it really is. the important part. It is, and in a perfect world, that's what happens, right? And maybe that happens. I don't know, maybe I experience maybe sixty percent of the time. But then you have other clients where forty percent of the time they just, you know, it was very common back in two thousand nine, right when the market was down, the S and P five hundred was down fifty percent. March two thousand nine, we bottomed out. People were just like, I can't take it anymore. I, you know, I can't take it. And, and so we had to figure out a way to not have them abandon ship. And so even though you might say, well, I'm not going to use these funds, you know, for 20 years or for 15 years, therefore I can be, you know, 80% stocks and 20% bonds or even 100% stocks, right? Some people can't actually stick to that plan. And so it's, it's really, even though they know what's best, they're still going to have a second help in a dessert if it's available. And so it's a matter of sort of saying, okay, well, how do we have something that's still going to reach your goals? I think ultimately that my job as a, as a financial advisor is to make sure that we're taking the least amount of risk to sort of meet those needs, right? That's the idea is how can we, how can we reach those goals and take the least amount of risk to still get us there? And that's the idea. Try to minimize the downsides, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. You want to try to limit as much as possible. As you're getting closer and closer to that goal, you should be getting more and more conservative in the portfolio. Absolutely. That makes sense. Matt, Matt and I have been talking a lot about tax changes and uh, wanted to see how that is impacting your investment strategies. Yeah, there's been some big tax law changes. And I think what, you know, fundamentally what we've seen around that is just the whole idea that the more cash in the markets, right, with the tax reductions for corporations, for individuals as well, this, you know, the example I have still clients who do more cash in pockets, and generally when that money is in the pockets, you know, you're going to spend it, whether it's a corporation doing buybacks, whether it's a corporation uh, hiring employees. All those things sort of work out to be good for equities, if you will. And so we're expecting that, um, that the markets are going to continue to, to do well. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be normal corrections along the way. You know, the market's the economic cycle is always a cycle of expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction. We've been expanding for quite some time. We think that expansion is going to continue, um, but there will be a correction, right? It will contract. Uh, nobody has a crystal ball to know when that is. I think fundamentally those tax law changes are going to you know, sort of help the economy, at least in the short term of the next one to, to three years. There's just going to be a lot of cash coming back, especially when you look at all these larger companies bringing back all that overseas money. Right. And it's just going to, you know, you're seeing the expansion, the hiring of jobs, all those things are going to be good for the economy. So that's number one thing we're seeing in terms of, you know, is there a specific change to people's investment strategy or portfolios? No. You know, we haven't seen anything specific around that. Uh, we've still seen people just wanting to understand it's normal for the market to go through corrections. You know, we always say a dip When the market dips. It's generally going down about five to nine percent. That should happen on average about three to four times a year. That's the normal you know, uh, frequency of when we have a dip, five to nine percent. 
we haven't been accustomed to that for five years almost, it seems like. We're getting back into that this year, I think, mm-hmm. in terms of some of the volatility. Yeah, we're generally trying. seeing a lot more volatility. Yeah, year. and, you know, a correction. When the market goes down 10 to 19%, we typically call that a correction. That happens about once a year. We had one just a couple months ago in January. Prior to that, we didn't have one for two years. Last one before that was uh, January of 2016. And then before that, it was August 2015. And then before that, it was like 40 years without a correction. Very unusual times. And when the market goes down 20% or more, we call that a bear market. And that happens on average about every three to four years. And it's been about eight to nine years since that's happened. So I'm just telling my clients, and I think we're going to continue upon this you know, economic expansion uh, in the near term. But you know, there's a correction coming, right? We always, sure. we always have one coming. There's a bear market coming. And that doesn't mean that you're going to change your goals. It means you might invest some money if you have some extra money available. But it doesn't mean you're going to abandon your goals. What about some of the more looming macro issues or threats? Like, I mean, the national debt is one thing that kind of, you know, tends to concern me as an accountant. I look at that balance sheet and that, you know, I don't like seeing a lot in the liability section. You know, is that a concern? I mean, it's, it's got to be a concern. The interest is just, you know, on that debt's massive. Yeah, I think on some of these bigger, you know, issues, what, what I always try to tell people is those are issues, you know, we've got to deal with those issues. I mean, we've got bigger issues than that in terms of Social Security, bigger issues, frankly, in that in terms of health care, right, and, and how we're going to challenge those things. But fundamentally, what we're investing in is capital markets and how capital markets work. And I like to talk about it in terms of capital markets because it's really how we want to use our capital. And so we might have issues and concerns longer term about debt, might have interest or concerns longer term about interest rates, you know, about, you know, war, right, about all these, you know, all these different things. But fundamentally, what we're investing in with clients is, is capital markets. And capital markets don't stop working in those environments. They still work. People are still going to the store buying groceries. Still buying toilet paper, toothpaste, you know, napkins, whatever it may be. You know, um, businesses are still out there purchasing goods for the services they provide. And all those things are still working. So fundamentally what the stock market reacts to is the ability for companies to, to make that capital and turn a profit with it. And that's what really drives things in the long run. So there's, you know, if you go back and you look at, at, at time and you go back to the early 1900s and you just sort of, look at the markets going through all that time, there's always been huge concerns, big, you know, social economic issues that people have been concerned about. And yet the market has continued to grow. So the choice is do you leave your money in cash under your you know your bed? Right? Do you leave it in in CDs? Oh right? gold buried in back yard. Yeah, <laughs> gold, things like that. You, know, you don't want to do that, right? You have to trust that capital markets work and, and they're going to continue to work and that's what we're really investing in. So and, you know, another good quote from, uh, from Warren Buffett was that capitalism works. It doesn't work for everybody, right? And it's not like if we have equality all the way across the economic markets, but capital markets work. And that's something you don't want to bet against. Long term, yeah. Long term. Hey, there's a couple other things that I wanted to get your, your sort of perspective on that I was thinking about. You guys are asking about retirement and you know, how do people know when they should be retired and and some other things like that. And, and what I'm beginning to see in a lot of our academic research is that retirement is changing. And I don't mean it's changing in the next five years or 10 years, but when we look out over some of the advances that are happening, we're really expecting longevity to increase, you know, and we're seeing that it's not going to be like our dad's retirement. You know, I, I don't think your retirement is going to be like, like, you know, our parents' retirement where they stopped working, they worked one job, maybe two jobs, and they took their pension and and then you had 40 years in retirement or 30 years in retirement. Right. I'm seeing more and more things where people are going to have many retirements, where they're going to retire for a little bit, retool, if you will, go back to work in a different kind of career or do some other kind of part-time work. You know, we hear about that gig economy. We hear other things like that. I was at a conference recently where they were sort of saying that beginning in like 2029, your longevity is going to increase one year for every year that you're alive. You know, and the technology, healthcare technology is just going to really get that, that longevity out there that you're going to see people with this sort of expanding retirement of different jobs. That's what we're trying to help. Yeah, I, I agree that what retirement is is definitely changing. I'm seeing that with my clients get to that point. And th- we're doing some tax strategy stuff around that, too, because a lot of these, you know, clients are in their, you know, late 50s, to early 60s. 
you know, they're, they're getting ready. They want to work as hard as they've been working. They want to slow down for sure and start to enjoy things like that. They also don't want to stop working completely and yeah. be bored. So they kind of want something in the middle. And they have they have a skill set, really valuable. You know, they have the gray hair. They have a lot of the wisdom. And so, you know, part of our strategy is, you know, why don't you look into retiring from your job and coming back on by that company or a couple companies a more of a consultant type role because we got this new pastor deduction thing. And if you keep your income under certain limits, which they're likely to be if they're working more part-time capacity, they can get this 20% pastor deduction thing. We actually have, they're working out of their homes. So they can take the home office deduction. That gets us around a little bit of the $10,000 cap on the state and local property taxes now. We can write off some of the other costs they're incurring towards the business. We can still set up a little bit of retirement planning stuff while you're continuing to work and sheltering some income from tax. And so you're still making income. You're still working a little bit, but you're being way more tax efficient about it than you are when you're a really high income earning employee. You don't really have a lot of options in terms of write-offs. So I think it's kind of like an interesting side impact of this new tax law as it actually lends itself even more to some of that, you know, consulting type work where you're on your own taking the pass your deduction and, and keeping your income low enough. You can be tax efficient for, a long time. The hardest part is healthcare, though. What I've what yeah. seen, you know, what are you going to do about the healthcare? And and I can't imagine an individual trying to figure that out on their own. I, I just, you know, all those things that you just rattled off. Listen to our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen to your podcast, but I'm going to just say, like, you know, hire a professional. Hire somebody who can who can coach you through that that sort of different stages of retirement and how to take advantage of those kinds of things and how to do it tax wise, right? Uh, I think that's just great. And actually, I, I think there's going to be a lot of health benefits to continuing to work and having that purpose. I mean, studies have found that people that have purpose live a lot longer. So, Yeah, I remember all the stories of somebody retires and they die like a year later, right? Yeah, they're yeah. like, now what? Yeah, now what? And so, yeah, we're seeing that too. We're seeing that to where if you stay engaged with the work and you enjoy the work, Right now, if you got a nine to five job that you just hate, well, you know, get out, right? But that's not worth it. But if you enjoy the work and you can contribute, all that adds to a more enriching retirement, a more enriching life, which is what, what we're all about too. Yeah, I mean, you see it on, you know, we see it, I think, but I'm sure you see it also that you know, certain personality types of clients are they tend to live a little bit, you know, longer or they're healthier and doing better as they get older because they're still like, to some extent, driven and, and doing stuff and staying active and moving around and not just kind of sitting there, you know, fading away. Yeah, I say those things. And I also say yoga, even though I don't really do yoga myself. For whatever reason, I see these clients and they're just in like phenomenal health at like 85. They're happy. They're just doing great. And I'm like, what, what did you do? And, you know, invariably a theme has been yoga, you know, for these people. So. So after our listeners listen to this podcast, what they're going to take away from it is, I will do yoga to live longer. <laughs> and work part-time as a consultant. That's right. There you go. <laughs> all those and good all things. Yeah. You guys have anything else you want to cover? We're at, um, yeah, we're at, yeah. cut all this part out, obviously. I would say, so that's a good point about yoga. I think there's there's something else that I've, I've started talking to clients a little bit about. And, and this goes back to the financial media. When you have that stress coming to you, I think we need to own the market corrects. I think we need to understand that there are some things we can't control. We talked about that. But there are also some things that we can do that are positive. And so I've been talking a lot with clients about some positive addictions that I think people should do. And some of those are exercise, right? Doing some sort of exercise. It doesn't have to be super high intensity mm -hmm. or anything else. Another one is, is going to work, right? Going to work and, and sort of, you know, rolling up the sleeves and, and sort of ignoring what's going on around you and getting your job done. Another one that you can really do is solitude, I think, taking some time to be with yourself a little bit. And then the other one is really quality relationships. So when clients have asked me at different times, you know, well, what should I do about the financial media? What should I do about some of these other things? I'll start talking to them about practicing some positive addictions. And those might be some things to think about too. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, those are those are things you, your whole life, right? Yeah. So you should be trying to take advantage of that kind of stuff. I mean, you feel so much better when you're working out and staying healthy, right? I mean, we joke about tax season or busy season kind of being rough and hard and that kind of stuff. But actually, I love tax season. And when I'm in it, the day goes by so fast before I know it's 5 o'clock because I've just been busy in it working hard the whole time so you don't even realize how quickly it goes by right and then yeah time to reflect solitude i think is important to reflect back and that's part of writing down your goals is then writing them down 
then seeing how they compare to the actual outcome and then reflecting on that a little bit and, and thinking, you know, about why and why not, you know, what worked, what didn't work, right, in, a, in an objective manner, you know, you don't beat yourself up about it if it didn't work out, right, you just try and figure out what didn't work and why and then try and correct and, and do better the next time if that's what's required, you know, or if it's on track, think about why it's on track and was it because of the way you thought it was or was it something else, but you use those opportunities for reflection to look back and then adjust your goals, right, and that's hugely important. It's hard to find that time when you have three small kids, but yeah. you know, you can you gotta find a way sometimes, you know. Good. Hey well it's been a, a real pleasure to be on the podcast with you, fine gentlemen, and I uh, hope hope it was a value to your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Scott, for being on. That's all for today's episode of Debit This Credit That Podcast. As always, if you have questions, you can contact your Wheeler Accountants Prepare or submit a question online at our website in the Ask Wheeler section at the bottom of the page. Please remember to follow us on social media for regular updates at Wheeler CPAs and on LinkedIn and Facebook. Thanks for listening as we help you solve for accounting.